The Fisherman's Daughter by Gavin Miller Even in the years of her greatness, Susanna never forgot that her father had been a fisherman. When she was very young, her family had all lived together in a tiny stone-walled cottage that overlooked a quiet harbour. Whenever her father's boat returned home, Susanna's mother would carry her down to the quay to see the wriggling silver treasure that he had conjured up from the sea. After holding both of Susanna's cheeks in his sea-rasped hands, the fisherman would hoist the little girl up onto his shoulders and carry her in triumph back to her house for a feast of steamed lobster or whole salmon stuffed with crab. One autumn, when Susanna was five years old, the family decided to travel northwards up the coast to spend the dark months of winter with her grandmother. The old lady had never seen her only grandchild and was excited by the letter that arrived by another fishing boat, announcing their imminent arrival. The letter said that Susanna's father had decided to make one last catch of the season before setting out for their new resting place. Though the resultant haul exceeded all expectations, her mother grew worried that they were a little late in the year to be sailing so far north. But her father was confident that they could put it into shore at the first sign of trouble. The journey itself started calmly enough, with Susanna sitting in the prow of the ship, staring out at the glittering waves. The wind blew through her hair as she reveled in finding herself out in open water. The land was a distant sliver on the horizon, and Susanna started to daydream about what adventures might unfold if they kept sailing up the coast, all the way to the land of ice. Her father had told her stories of giant white bears that ate people for supper, but she was sure that he was teasing her. Susanna's mother interrupted the little girl in her musings and wrapped her in a warm woolen cloak. Lost in thought, Susanna hadn't noticed that she had started to shiver. Looking up, she saw that the sky had begun to turn dark and that the waves were growing larger and more menacing, with great caps of spray being thrown off like scattered seeds in the wind. Susanna's mother took her by the hand. Stumbling in the heaving planks, they made their way to the little canvas shelter in the middle of the boat. It afforded them some protection as Susanna's father held the rudder with a firm hand, glad that their destination was only a mile away. It seemed as if the journey might end well, but then the wind grew fiercer and louder until it howled like a tortured sea monster. Suddenly the little craft tilted violently to one side as a sudden gust of wind tore the rigging from the mast. Both mother and daughter had to crouch down to avoid being swept overboard by the rampaging sails. Looking back, Susanna saw her father fighting with the lurching ship as it bucked and twisted under his grip. Losing all forward motion, the rudder became useless in his hands. He began to bail with all his might as waves lapped over the sides of the open boat. All three took leather buckets and tried to keep the boat afloat as it was tossed about by the churning ocean. One high wave caught the boat broadside and smashed it savagely, ripping off the rudder. It was all they could do to keep from capsizing by shifting their weight from one side to another. As they drifted closer to land, the waves grew less wild, but the wind caught the little craft and sent it into a slow spin. Susanna's father, seeing what had to be done, broke out an oar and tried to counter the gyrations. With great ploughing strokes in the water, he fought the wind and waves and set the craft on a steady bearing for land. Despite his finest efforts, a malevolent tide carried them from shore. Both parents tried beyond exhaustion to save the ailing ship. Row as hard as they might, the boat was dragged northwards beyond the grandmother's cove. Finally, the tide turned and they were dragged in again, but this time towards a row of foam-spattered rocks. As Susanna's father still struggled with the oars, her mother realised that they might all be dashed to pieces. She took Susanna and tied the little girl to three of the rope-covered glass floats that her father used to mark the location of lobster pots. As the vessel drifted closer to its destruction, Susanna, bewildered, clung to her mother for warmth. Looking over her mother's shoulder, she saw her father fighting grimly with the waves, as first one oar and then the other was ripped from his hands by the sea. Abandoning all hope, he dragged himself over the half-submerged deck towards his huddled family. Taking the little girl in his arms, he kissed her on the forehead. He brought his lips close to her ear, cupping it with his hand so that she might hear him above the storm. We love you, he cried, and before she knew what was happening, 
Susanna had been lifted up over the side of the boat and placed down in the water. Buoyed up by the makeshift raft, Susanna watched helplessly as her mother and father disappeared into the storm. Crying out not to be left alone, she tugged at the ropes and knots so that she might be free to join them in a watery grave. But her mother had tied them well. Overcome with exhaustion and grief, the little girl became limp and was left at the mercy of the storm. When the tempest was over, it was found that Susanna had been washed ashore, still breathing. No sign of the fishing boat remained, and her parents had vanished into the sea as if they had never existed. And so it was that grandmother and granddaughter met for the first time, and Susanna, with tears in her eyes, was ushered into her new home. For the first month, Susanna was inconsolable, crying into her pillow every morning and refusing all food except for a little milk. Her grandmother decided to come and sit by the little girl as her wizened fingers busied themselves with knitting pullovers for the winter to come. After a week, the old lady saw that her granddaughter had started to take little glimpses to see what she was up to, and the girl's sobbing had become a little less insistent. After another week of curious peeping, Susanna came over to the old lady and asked to be allowed to watch. Within a few days she had dried her eyes and started to learn the secrets of her grandmother's craft. Both hoped that busy hands might help to distract them from their grieving hearts. As Susanna grew, each morning was spent mending nets for the fishermen, but each afternoon was dedicated to reading into which she plunged with eagerness. She soon exhausted her grandmother's small library and then had to borrow books from all the other people in the village. At the end of each day, as the light was fading, she used to walk several miles to a special river to bring back fresh water for the cottage. The water was especially soft and she used it to wash her hair, which was long and very beautiful. It was golden like a field of wheat in sunshine, and sometimes as she slept it lay on the pillow in gentle waves, as if the motion of the sea had crept into her comb. On one particular afternoon, Susanna was especially preoccupied. She had recently read an account of how Hannibal had brought elephants over the Alps, which was most exciting, but the book unfortunately did not contain any illustrations. Susanna had never seen an elephant and was not altogether sure what they looked like. The blacksmith described them as spindly and tall with towering necks that let them eat high up leaves. The furrier insisted that they had the legs of an ox, the ears of a wolf and one giant horn sticking out of the middle of their foreheads. The fishermen were no more helpful, saying that they had noses like enormous snakes which could wrap themselves around a man and pick him up, and giant ears like a ship in full sail. Despairing that she would ever learn the truth, Susanna lay down with her hair in the water and looked up at the clouds, wondering whether this fluffy blob or that most resembled the animal in question. At this time, in the same part of the country, young Prince Henry was also much distracted. His parents were insisting that he should choose a bride from among the many ladies of the court. But the song of love had yet to play on his heartstrings, so he used to slink away on his favourite horse to go hunting in the countryside. His pride and joy was an ostrich-plumed hat that had been brought to him from Africa. He would wear it on these secret adventures, since it complimented his emerald green eyes and made him seem taller than he really was. As it happened, he was pursuing a fox, more in sport than with the intention of killing it, when he stumbled upon Susanna as she lay with her hair in the river. His first thought was that she might be dead, having slipped on a rock as she stooped for water. He dismounted from his horse and crept closer with bated breath. He had just noticed to his great relief that her eyes were moving when the young woman looked up suddenly and said, You don't look like an elephant. The prince's heart sank. Perhaps the girl was mad. No. Then what does one look like? Prince Henry paused for a moment, stumped by this unexpected question. They have long noses, big ears, and feet like tree trunks, I think. Susanna frowned and looked back at the clouds. That is just a tale told by fishermen. I assure you that it came directly from the man who sold me this hat, and he had seen one. At this very moment, a giant pike from the lake below had chosen to swim upstream in pursuit of rainbow trout. Sensing danger, the little fish had sought safety in the frond-like shelter of Susanna's hair. But they had found their refuge too late as the hungry predator opened its jaws and chased in after them, becoming horribly entangled in the golden strands. 
Susanna was worried that she had been rude and was about to compliment the prince on his magnificent hat when she felt herself being dragged into the water by her hair. Clutching at the grass and rocks with her fingers, she called out for help just as her mouth filled with water. Furious at this interruption, she swung herself round underwater and planted her feet firmly in the riverbed, which was fortunately not too deep. As she stood up, she grasped her hair with one hand, as with the other she took out a knife that she carried to protect herself from wild animals. She was about to plunge a dagger into the offending fish when the prince misunderstood her intentions and yelled out, Stop! Susanna hesitated as the prince added, It would be a crime to cut off such beautiful hair. I will come and disentangle you. Susanna started to reply that she had had no such intention when the pike, summoning all its strength, swam violently with such a jolt that Susanna dropped her knife and was dragged back under the water. This time Susanna was pulled out to the middle of the river and started to drift downstream. Struggling to surface for breath, the young woman glimpsed the prince as he took out his sword and leapt into the fast-moving water. As quickly as the trouble began, it stopped. The pike opened its jaws and swam free. Susanna, much relieved, waded ashore, bogged down as she was with wet clothes. Catching her breath, she looked back and saw the prince being dragged ever further out into the flow, and swim as hard as he might, he was swept further away down the river. Susanna struggled onto dry land, and then approached the prince's horse, thinking that she might use it to follow him more quickly. The animal shot her a reproving look, and then bolted off along the river bank in pursuit of its master. Susanna tried running after the prince, but it was hopeless. Exhausted and waterlogged as she was, she had to stop. Wet, cold and miserable, Susanna arrived at her grandmother's house, unable to stop thinking of the prince. She kept seeing his ostrich-plumed hat and emerald green eyes as he plunged into the water to save her. She went over their meeting a thousand times, thinking of all the brilliant things that she might have said to win the prince's heart. At other moments, she thought it would have made no difference. She was a fisherman's daughter, and he was the son of a king. Now he was lost to her forever, and she didn't even know his name. After a week of little rest, Susanna grew pale. Her tousled hair lost much of its luster, and her eyes became red with sleeplessness. Her grandmother asked Susanna what was wrong, and the girl told her everything. She had kept it secret until then, thinking that no one would believe her. You have two choices, explained the wise old woman. You must win the prince, or forget him. I could never forget him. Then you must find a way into his heart. There is a wise man on the far side of the mountains who is famous for his magic and his worldly knowledge. You must go to him and ask how to make the prince fall in love with you. But not with magic spells. I want him to love me for myself as I love him. I did not say to deceive him with a potion, but fate sometimes needs a little nudge. The next day, Susanna set off on foot into the mountains. She filled her basket with dried fish, fresh apples, and some of the hard biscuits that the fishermen of her village used on long voyages. Each day, she climbed higher and higher, and the weather grew colder and more threatening. At night, she would hide in one of the many caves, only slightly less afraid of being eaten by a bear than of freezing to death. During the day, she clambered over crumbling boulders and stepped carefully across bridges of ice. Five days after she had begun, Susanna arrived at the outer walls of the wise man's castle. Above her head, she saw forty feet of vertical granite blocks crowned with a row of hideous gargoyles. Each was poised to gush boiling oil onto any attackers and slit windows threatened a hail of arrows. Susanna could see that escape from such a fortress would be impossible once she was inside it. She steeled her nose for the encounter to come and cried out, Mordred, great wizard, I come here to ask for your aid. There was no reply. She tried again. Mordred, I've walked five days to ask this question of you. I am alone. With a sudden crack, one of the blocks of granite halfway up the wall slid backwards and then to one side. Mordred the wizard peered out from the gloom within. He wore a magnificent blue cloak covered with our chemical symbols embroidered onto it in gold. What is it that you want? he asked suspiciously. You must teach me how to win the heart of a man. Show me your face. Susanna pulled back the hood of her cloak. Your face is pretty enough. You do not need my help. But I have travelled far to get here. In that case, here's my advice. Smile a lot. Laugh at his jokes. Don't be too easy or too difficult and be kind to his dog. Men are fools when it comes to love. 
but this man is a prince. Then you would have me give you an elixir of love so that you can steal his heart and plunder his kingdom? I do not wish to trick him, but my grandmother said that fate sometimes needs a little nudge. The wizard paused. And if I help you, what can I expect in return? Susanna frowned. She hadn't really thought about that. It would have to be a great gift to be worthy of achieving her heart's desire. Further lowering the hood of her cloak, she pulled out the tresses of her hair. They tumbled down like a waterfall of gold, almost reaching the snow at her feet. You may have my hair. The wizard felt a sudden quickening of the blood and his eyes flashed with fire. If I am to teach you my secrets, he announced, you must become my apprentice. Willingly, replied Susanna. But to do so, you must fulfill three tasks of my choosing within one year. If you succeed, I will teach you how to cast a spell to win the heart of a prince. And if I fail, you will become my prisoner to treat as I see fit. To what purpose? The knights are cold in the castle. Susanna blushed at the effrontery of the old man, but she swallowed her reproof to him. What are the three tasks? You will only find out that once you decide to try. That does not seem fair. Then walk home and forget about your prince. Susanna knew that was impossible, but she still delayed. Seeing her hesitation, the wizard softened his manner a little and said, You must be cold in the castle. Come inside and sit by the fire. Then you can make up your mind at your leisure. I will only go inside once I have decided my freedom is worth more than warm toes. But Susanna already knew what she would do. She loved the prince, but did not know how to win him. And perhaps she could achieve the three tasks after all. Mordred grew impatient. I see that your pride is greater than your love. Burning with rage, Susanna controlled her rebellious tongue. I agree to your bargain. Three tasks in less than a year, or I am yours. To do with as I will? To do with as you will. The wizard rubbed his hands together in delight. But if you try to force yourself on me before the year is out, you will wish rather that all the harpies of hell had descended on your flesh than that you should break your word to the daughter of a fisherman. The wizard's triumphant smile vanished as quickly as it had appeared. You have my solemn oath, and you have mine. As the wizard slipped from view, the stones at the base of the wall rearranged themselves into a magnificent entranceway. The newly revealed doors swung open and Mordred stood in the full light before Susanna. He was younger than she had first thought, with flecks of black in his greying beard. Taking her hand, the wizard swiftly led her back through layer after layer of the castle's defences. Between one set of walls was a deep trench filled with evil-smelling tar. The next held great machines built like horizontal windmills armed with swords. The one after that was filled with glowing volcanic lava which oozed restlessly, awaiting its next victim. Finally, in the inner courtyard, Susanna was relieved to see plain stone slabs and a tall, round tower. This is where you will live, announced Mordred. Susanna and he went inside to a meagre supper eaten in silence. The next day, Susanna awoke bright and early. She washed up the dishes, swept the kitchen floor and moved the furniture around into a more convenient arrangement. Mordred was slow to stir, and when he did finally stumble into the kitchen, he looked tired and somewhat bleary-eyed. Susanna immediately asked, What is my first task? There will be plenty of time for that. You should spend a few days settling into the castle. That was not part of the bargain. If I only have a year, I should start straight away. Very well. Mordred led Susanna to a room high up in the tower. It had a large arched window that revealed the walls below and a distant view of the mountains. There was a single wooden chair, an easel and some paints. Your first task is to paint a picture which is so realistic that I can eat it for breakfast. But I've never painted, protested Susanna. Then you must learn, growled the wizard, and he left her to her work. Susanna knew that it was hopeless. No one could paint a picture that you could eat for breakfast, but she felt that she owed it to herself to try. For the next three months, Susanna applied herself with all the ingenuity she could muster. She experimented by mixing oils with different pigments, and with practice she learned how to layer them into mirages of light and shade. But however vibrantly she painted oranges, or meticulously recreated pieces of bread, she knew that the pictures stayed as just that. No thirst would be quenched by the drops of dew on her grapes, nor hunger slaked by the waxy translucency of her cheeses. 
As winter turned to spring, she threw open the great window to let in more light. The view that greeted her was forbidding. Not a plant grew, not a single creature was in sight. The castle, with its strange odours and stark walls, had excluded any hint of life. The young woman became lonely for her village and imagined the countryside around it bursting into song. She remembered her grandmother's garden drenched with flowers and the trees filled with apple blossoms. To calm her melancholy, she painted watercolours of fine petals and recreated each branch using heavy oils, speckling the paint until it almost felt like bark. When at last the picture was finished, she crept to bed with tears in her eyes and the conviction in her heart that she would be a prisoner forever. The next day, when she returned to the room, she noticed two remarkable things. The first was a sprinkling of twigs that had appeared out of nowhere on the canvas, and the second was a fat, ponderous bee that was rubbing itself against the watercolour of her grandmother's flowers. The bee was in fact a queen, and after this unsuccessful attempt at one last meal, she settled herself in and began to build a hive in a corner of the room. Staying in the shadows, Susanna watched over the next few days, hoping to find the secret of the magically appearing twigs. After waiting patiently for many hours, she saw a robin redbreast appear carrying more twigs in its beak. The little bird set about building a nest on the picture of the branch that Susanna had created. After a week, the sprinkling had been transformed into a springy cushion fit for the most precious of gems. The robin, proud of his work, sang with joy at the top of his voice, calling out for his lady love to blow in on the wind. She soon arrived, circling him and pecking suspiciously at his handiwork. After much delay, all seemed satisfactory, and within a short time, there lay two perfect eggs, nestled beneath the lover's feathery warmth. Susanna went to look for the wizard in the dungeon, where he used to sock, surrounded by bubbling glass vessels and jars of mysterious powders. Mordred, the first task is done. Ridiculous, exclaimed the wizard. No one can paint a picture realistic enough to eat. He raced ahead of her into the room, frightening off the birds which flew out of the open window. What is this? I painted a tree in the nest with these two eggs appeared as if by magic. And if that is not breakfast enough to feed her appetite, here is honey made from watercolour blossoms. The wizard was flushed with anger. You will not trick me twice, he yelled and stormed out of the room. Susanna was secretly glad that the eggs had been left undisturbed. She very carefully placed the nest on the windowsill outside so that love would find fruition in a family. The honey, however, she consumed with a little bread from the kitchen. She was still licking her fingers when she came downstairs to ask Mordred for the next task. Surely you should rest after your great labours, he suggested bitterly. That was not in the promise, she reminded him. Very well, but this time no cheating. Susanna could have retorted that she had not cheated this time, but she bit her tongue, which after all still tasted of honey. Mordred led her to a second room which, unlike the first, was completely empty. Your second task is to build a chair that is fit for a king and which can support my weight. Susanna was delighted. This seemed easier than the first task. What materials can I use? Only what is in this room. But it's empty. You may not leave the room until either you concede defeat or build the chair, and do not think that you can cradle me in your arms. Susanna glared at the old man as if that was the last thing in the world she had in mind, but he continued with his speech. There will be plenty of time for that when you fail. Just to be sure that there are no tricks this time, you must leave the room and close the door behind you before I sit on the chair. The wizard then walked out, confident of his success. Susanna slumped down. Building a chair out of nothing was impossible, but she owed it to herself to try. An idea came to her. She bent down very low and carefully examined the stone slabs of which the floor was made. Perhaps she could pry one up and build a chair of stone. But all the joints were sound and the stones would have been too heavy to lift anyway. She scraped at the walls, but those joints were even firmer and the ceiling was a single expanse of immovable grey slate. Perhaps she could make a hammock from her clothes. Then she noticed that in her haste to show the wizard the nest and honey, she had only put on a thin slip and a few undergarments. She had promised herself not to reveal all her beauty to the lascivious magician until she failed in her task. So undressing was out of the question. 
She leaned back against the wall with tears in her eyes. Maybe it was impossible and she had to admit defeat. She played idly with strands of her hair as images of an ostrich-plumed hat flashed before her eyes. When she came back to her senses, she saw that she had made a braid like she used to do when she was a little girl. In a flash, she saw the answer. Being from a fishing village, her grandmother was an expert in tying ropes into knots of different shapes. She was so skilled, in fact, that she could take a single strand of hemp and sculpt it into a basket for bread, or weave it into an undulating sea serpent to frighten the children. With the knowledge gathered from all the days spent with her grandmother, Susanna knotted her hair into cords of great strength and beauty. Each strand had a different shape, sometimes breaking out into starbursts or at other times twisting into swirling patterns of spiral shells. Yet another was like a lover's ladder with footholds carefully crafted for a midnight tryst. Down below, the strands were woven into a seat of rippling braids. Each became a wave in an unquiet ocean on which a small flotilla of ships sailed with nets outcast, just resting on the surface of the water waiting to catch the first fish of morning. When all was complete, Susanna called out to Mordred. I've done enough, the wizard gloated in his victory before even opening the door. So you concede defeat at last. No, I've created the chair. What? Let me see. The door opened and the wizard strode across the room towards her. He was then stopped in his tracks as a look of alarm and wonder flitted across his face. Examining the chair in detail, he marveled at the intricacy of the design and the skill of the craftsmanship. Do you think it is fit for a king? Indeed I do, but that does you no good. I said that you must leave the room and shut the door behind you. I see no scissors in your pocket or knife in your hand, and even if you could cut your hair, there is nothing to hang it from. There is plenty to hang both it and you. Susanna walked over to the door, carefully draped her hair over the top of it, and then left the room, closing the door behind her. The wizard was furious but undefeated. He approached the chair as it hung there in its golden splendour. He must sit and try it. Perhaps the knots would unravel. Positioning himself carefully over the tranquil ocean, he sat down as hard as he could manage. Now the door fitted only poorly to the top of the frame, and the full weight of the wizard tugged at Susanna on the other side. She was lifted a good six inches off the tips of her toes, and she wanted, above everything else, to cry out in pain. But she was a fisherman's daughter. If the sea could not break her, she would surely not give in to the weight of an old man. "'Do you concede defeat?' she asked. The wizard was lost in the fragrance of her hair. How sweet it smelled and how soft against his cheek. If she escaped his grasp, he would never be content again. He resolved that the third task would be truly impossible, but he could savour this moment just a little longer. Susanna bit into her hand to stop herself from screaming. She tasted blood in her mouth and felt as if her head was split in two. Just as she knew that she could stand the pain no longer... The door suddenly opened and she fell in a crumpled heap to the floor and was covered over with the bedraggled remnants of her victorious throne. The next one will not be so easy, yelled the wizard, who then marched off more furious than ever. After he left, and despite her triumph, Susanna lay there sobbing for an hour. The following day, Susanna was not so keen to find out about her next task. She had decided instead to make preparations. Wearing her baggiest cloak, she filled her pockets with two bottles of water, a barrel of biscuits, two pencils, a chisel, a book of mathematical tables, and a coil of rope. When she was sure that all was concealed from view, she approached Mordred. He looked at her knowingly as if the cloak was invisible. "'You won't need any of the things that you have thought to steal from me,' he announced. Despite herself, Susanna blushed with embarrassment at being found out. Mordred reveled in this small victory. This time cheating is beyond even you. He grabbed Susanna's hand and almost dragged her up a winding stairway to the highest room in the tower. Despite her foreboding, Susanna found that she liked their destination. The ceiling of the room was made of a cartwheel of beams supporting a circular roof and underneath, the young woman was presented with an array of dusty musical instruments. There were hunting horns, marching drums, silver flutes, and an elaborately shaped harp in the form of a mermaid. Your final task is to produce a musical sound that destroys the wall of the castle. Even a thousand musicians could do no such thing. So you concede defeat? 
I still have six months. Use them wisely, then. I shall be waiting. Susanna looked around in despair. She had heard stories of a soprano at court who could shatter a wine glass with her voice, but destroying an entire castle was altogether different. The trumpeting of a hundred elephants would not disturb such stones, and the strumming of a single girl seemed without all hope of success. Susanna sat idly down by the mermaid harp, admiring its delicate face and curvaceous tail. For the first time since entering the castle, she realised that she might never see the ocean again or feel its spray against her cheek. To bring it fresh into her mind's eye, she played a little sea shanty that she had learned from an old sailor. He used to stop by and bring her grandmother a bottle of rum at the beginning of each winter. Susanna's voice was out of practice, but the room echoed richly and she grew more confident. After it was done, she wondered what to do next. She reasoned that in six months her life would not be her own. The wizard would have possession of her and her time and her freedom would be lost. She was not afraid of him, but she did fear that she might forget her grandmother and the village and all those she held dear. To keep such thoughts alive, she decided to compose a ballad to tell the story of her life. In it, she described the shipwreck that had left her an orphan. She extolled her grandmother's love, adored the handsome prince, and vilified the sour-faced wizard who longed to have her as his prisoner. Each verse, sung in a minor key, was filled with trials or thoughts of loss, but the chorus was all smiles and trills, as princely eyes looked kindly on a speechless girl. Each afternoon, Susanna climbed up onto the roof of the tower, with the mermaid harp as her companion. She sang her ballad to the mountain tops as the wizard gleefully crossed off another day on his calendar. The castle walls mocked her music with a harsh, metallic echo, and the last rays of hope dwindled in her heart. As autumn turned to winter, this scene was repeated many times. The young woman knew that soon the snows would come again, and the walls of the castle would shut in on her life forever. For a final time, she went up onto the roof to conjure up her memories and bid the sun a fond farewell. Unbeknown to Susanna, a travelling minstrel approached the tower just as her song began. He was tired and cold and dearly hoped that he might sing for his supper and bed down for the night. He was just about to announce his arrival when a soft, melodious sound greeted his ears. Suddenly downcast, he knew that his poor skills would bring only jeers in such a place, for this castle was enchanted. Looking up at the darkening sky, he saw the outline of two mermaids singing as one played fairy music on the other's hair. Perhaps they both conspired to lure lonely travellers to their doom. He should plug his ears and flee. But then he thought that he could stay and learn their secrets. Concentrating with all his might, he memorised the words in tune as they wafted down to him. He comforted himself with the thought that another, lesser court might think it grand if he could recreate the lilt of siren song. When all was safely in his head, he slipped away, thankful to be still alive. Susanna, cold and shivering, clambered down from the roof, sure that her days of happiness were at an end. A week later, the court rustled in an expectant pause. The new minstrel was to be the highlight of yet another banquet to find a bride for the royal heir. As the introduction began, the prince himself was in a melancholy state. Despite his mother's urgings, none of the ladies of the court seemed worth wooing. One was too vain, another too avaricious, all seemed more impressed with his prospects than with himself. If he was going to fall in love, he felt sure that it would be with a stranger, perhaps one of the country girls who so often took his fancy, but they were usually too timid to talk with him. Not really listening to the words of the song, his mind drifted back to the day when he was out hunting and had stumbled across a maiden as she lay with her hair in the river. He had gone back two days later to try to find her, but she had vanished without a trace. All at once he saw that the words and the music were echoing his private thoughts and he sat up with a start. His eyes widened as the girl in the song picked through snow and ice to reach the wizard's castle. His cheeks grew red with indignation as the wicked old man tried to ensnare her. As the last refrain faded into the rafters, there was barely a dry eye in the palace. "'Where did you hear this sad lament?' demanded the prince. "'I composed it, your highness, to please the royal ear,' the minstrel hoped that this would gain him greater favour with the prince. "'And the girl you sang of? A harmless fancy to charm your heart. 
And what of this ostrich-plumed hat? Would I be seen dead in such a thing? Your Highness, the prince was not intended to be yourself. Your eyes are emerald green, I must admit, but the hat was pure invention. I often go riding in such a hat when I slip away from court. I do this in secret for safety's sake, and one day I did meet a girl by a river. Tell me the truth about this music, or you will suffer for it. I was up in the mountains, Your Highness. I know not where. Two mermaids in a high tower sang this melody to entrap me. I memorized their words and stole away, hoping to find recompense in such enchantment. Your payment will be the axe if you do not take me back there. It is monstrous that a girl should be imprisoned for loving a prince in his own kingdom. We shall lay siege to that castle and rescue her. The banquet hall was abuzz with whispering. Half the courtiers thought the prince had been ensnared by mermaid's trickery. The other half realised that their hopes of a royal husband were at an end. Bring me my generals and my engineers. We shall make siege machines to smash the walls and ingenious devices to overcome the perils which stand between this maiden and her freedom. And so it was that just two weeks after her final song, Susanna was awakened one morning by the sound of an approaching army. Going to her door, she found it locked. Mordred had bolted it from the outside as she slept. Going back to the window, she heard Prince Henry riding up to the outer gate. Mordred the wizard, you hold captive one of my loyal subjects. I demand that you release her immediately. What makes you think that she is here? This minstrel heard a plaintive song and repeated it to me. This minstrel lies, your highness. I turned out the rascal for stealing from me. He made up this story to be avenged. Susanna cried out to let her presence be known. I am here, your highness. Mordred has bolted my door, but not my window. The prince became furious. Mordred, I am your prince. Release her now. The castle is my home, and I am prince here. The maiden came to me of her own free will to be apprenticed in my dark arts. If by nightfall today she has not completed three tasks, then she is mine forever, on her sacred oath. Then no prince can come between us. The day is still young, and so are you. You know nothing of the reign of horrors that will lay waste to your army and shatter your bones if you attack me. I care nothing for your threats. By sunset we will know our fate one way or the other. But take care. If you harm this maiden and victory is ours, you will die for it. The prince surveyed the walls and observed the evil gargoyles. His eyes were keen to their danger and he withdrew to begin the battle. At his instruction, the soldiers hauled forward two huge catapults to bombard the outer defences. Made from the tallest trees in the kingdom, they were strong enough to throw boulders as large as houses against the castle. The first rock landed short of its target and smashed into jagged fragments on the ground. The second sailed out of view, producing little more than a distant plop as it sank into the river of Tar. The third, however, struck home, shattering the granite battlements into heaps of rubble. As the dust settled, the soldiers were able to see great iron gears that had made the stonework shift as if enchanted. Heartened that the wizard's magic was merely mechanical, they pressed on with the bombardment, levelling towers and ripping gates from their hinges. The prince was especially keen that none of his subjects should be exposed to undue danger. This war was of his own making, and he did not want his newfound love to be saddened by tragedy. Once he was content that the stonework posed no further threat, he advanced at the head of his men right up to the river of Tar. Protected by a wall of the soldiers' shields, the sappers tried pushing blocks of granite to build a road, but the stone was heavy. It sank into the glutinous morass within a few seconds. Fortunately, Susanna's song had been quite descriptive, and the prince was armed with unusual supplies. Cartloads of bulrushes were carried forward and cast into the blackness. Mixing with the tar, they became a stable surface that squelched underfoot but was no longer dangerous. He and his men crossed to the second wall. Moving quickly through the breach, they were confronted with the horizontal windmills, which swished great overlapping blades of steel through the air, threatening to slice in two anyone who ventured near. Before departing, the prince had dreamt up all manner of ways to defeat this lacerating monster. He had imagined acid to dissolve the metal, a bridge to span across it, fire to melt it. But finally he had settled on the simplest to arrange. Fishermen from Susanna's village carried forward two anchors that they had joined together with a thick iron chain. Heaving with all their might, the fishermen threw one anchor into the centre of the whirling knives. 
Immediately caught up, it wrapped itself around an axle, dragging the second anchor in towards it. A great scream of iron grinding on iron heralded the end of the device as muffled explosions were heard from deep within the earth. After a moment, the men pressed on again, this time over the third row of defeated stones. Buoyed up by the thoughts of victory, they were unprepared for the sudden wall of flame that greeted them. Nearly roasted by its ferocity, they quickly fell back, with many an eyebrow singed. It was later said that not a single moustache survived the battle against the evil wizard. Mordred stood on the roof of the central tower, jeering at their failure. The building had been untouched by the catapults, for it contained Susanna and the prince's hopes. Much chastened by this unexpected reversal, the prince and all his generals sat thinking what to do. There was little water round about and too few buckets to carry it anyway. The flames had stretched a hundred feet up into the sky, so ropes or any form of ladder would prove disastrous. Prince Henry, in much agitation, tossed a snowball from one hand to the other as he racked his brain for a new idea. There must be some way to quench this flame, he muttered as he threw the snowball on the ground in his frustration. As it landed, he was taken back to the time when he was a boy, playing with his grandfather in the depths of winter. They used to make a sn snowman of every shape and form, sculpting them into heroic captains or hibernating bears. One time a great snowball, intended to be the toe of an ogre, had rolled away from them and careened off down the mountain, gaining in size as it went. The prince had his answer. Forming his men into a double column, they marched up the slopes of the peak that overlooked the castle. Starting with a single handful, they made a ball that grew and grew until it was thirty feet high. Some men pushed from below, others brought lances and tree trunks to push higher up. It was huge, they had to confess, but maybe they'd been too ambitious. As it neared the perfect launching spot, the ball stuck fast, wedged into immobility by a half-submerged rock. Heave as they might, it would not budge. Finally, one of the soldiers suggested building a fire on the other side to slightly melt their strange projectile. Straw was brought, and rushes dipped in tar. The fire roared and then exploded into steam as melting snows touched glowing wood. A final shove and at last it moved majestically at first, but then with speed as it thundered down the mountain, absorbing snow, trees and debris as it leapt towards the tower. It finally sliced itself in two and drenched the river of lava with its melting slush. A plume of steam hid everything from view, and for a terrible moment the prince thought that the castle, the wizard and Susanna had been swept away by this man-made avalanche. But as the clouds subsided, he breathed again and rushed down the icy slopes to find her. Susanna saw the battle from the safety of her bedroom window, but was forced to run under the bed as the snowball hit. After the impact, her room was filled with dripping trees and mud-covered rocks. Climbing over this sudden indoor garden, she went to the window, carrying a hastily constructed rope ladder. She had made it from strips of bed linen and pieces of wood prized from the framework of her wardrobe. Throwing the ladder lightly over the window sill, she felt giddy seeing how far down she must climb. But her calculations had been correct and the end of the ladder just touched the ground. She started to descend as the prince ran up the heap of snow at the base of the tower. The would-be lovers were moments from reunion when Susanna glanced up and saw Mordred the wizard glowering back. He began pulling her ladder rung by rung back inside the tower. The faster she climbed, the harder he pulled. She was almost stationary against the wall of rock, as step after step took her closer to the end. Down below, Prince Henry was frantic, certain that his heart's desire was about to be dragged from view. Susanna reached the end of the ladder and dangled from the final rung, her feet scraping against the stones. Jump down to me. It's too far. I'll catch you. No, you'll be hurt. Now, before it's too late. Gazing up for a final time, Susanna saw the triumphant face of Mordred the wizard, he was working with unnatural speed, and he had murder in his eyes. Trusting to the strength of her lover's arms, Susanna released her grip. As she plummeted down towards the prince, she saw that he had been rather optimistic in his predictions. As they collided, the well-meaning man was knocked onto his back and pushed several feet below the surface of the snow. Both were plunged into blackness. Some seconds later, with her head aching, Susanna came back to consciousness. I killed him, she muttered to herself as she distractedly stroked an ostrich plume with her hand. Tears fell from her eyes and landed on the prince's cheeks, which were almost as pale as the cushion of snow beneath his head. Imperceptibly at first, and then with strength, Susanna realized that the prince was still breathing. 
Pulling him towards her, she rubbed her his icy hands, hoping to return a little warmth to their ashen grey. Finally, he stirred, and within a few moments his eyes opened in a smile. Light as a feather, he stuttered in a faint attempt at gallantry. The whole army arrived with a great battering ram, ready to destroy the door of the tower. Within minutes it was shattered, and Mordred the wizard stood before the recovering couple with a sword at his throat. Mordred the wizard, you have resisted your prince and sought to imprison one of his subjects. It is my gift to her that she may decide your punishment. After that is settled, she will return with me to the palace as my bride. Kill me now, then, for there is no kindness in her heart. Susanna was very grave. Mordred, what have you to say in your defence before I pronounce your fate? Speak freely, for my mind is not yet made up. Very well. I consider myself to have done no wrong. The bargain you entered into you made freely, knowing the price of failure. If it was unwise, that was your mistake, not my wickedness. In the year that followed, I kept my word, never forcing my advances on you. Out of fear of my anger, that is your belief, I have my own view. Susanna looked unimpressed. Do you have anything else to say? I would only add that in that time I taught you well. Oh, really, and what is it that you taught me? Mordred looked less wary. I taught you that it's possible to paint a picture so lifelike that it could be eaten for breakfast. True, although it was my skill that drew it. I taught you that a royal chair could be made from an empty room. I have my grandmother to thank for that. And I taught you that you could make a musical sound that would bring about the destruction of my castle. So you agree that I fulfilled my three tasks? I do. I'm curious, then. What great secrets would you have taught me once I had succeeded? That is for my own counsel. Come now, the tasks were fulfilled, the castle lies in ruins, does it not? And your life hangs in the balance. With sarcasm in his voice, the whispered answered. Since you insist so graciously, I will tell you. My great secret is that I have no secrets. When I was but twenty-five, I was no apprentice, but a knight-at-arms riding on a quest. On my travels I met Ilsa, a bewitching sorceress, who enticed me back to this castle and made me her husband. But on our wedding night this model of sweetness and seduction transformed into an evil hag who kept me prisoner. The spell she cast on me outlasted her life. I was trapped here until someone would come and destroy the castle walls. I'm sorry if I made you miserable, but my freedom was at stake too. If you had really failed, I would have released you, and all the sadder for me, since I came to love you, but knew that it is hopeless for one my age to woo a girl in the flower of her youth. The prince and all his soldiers stared at the wizard in amazement. Susanna's expression more closely resembled disbelief. She walked up to the old man with fury in her eyes and said, Here we see the wizard's true magic, a whispered spell that transforms a lust-filled jailer into a hapless victim. In the tavern of my village, I've heard many a drunken farmer explaining that they married a beautiful enchantress, only to have her turn into a heartless witch who doesn't understand them. Looking now with a steady eye, Susanna saw that the prince was indeed as handsome as she remembered. But, she reflected, she hardly knew him, and she owed it to herself to be cautious. Turning to the prince, she said, I would not have the same said of me. For that reason I will return to the palace with you, but not as your bride. The prince looked crestfallen. Susanna continued, Despite how we both feel, we do not have love. The prince began to object, but Susanna silenced him with a finger to his lips. But we have the chance of love. One may grow from the other, but it takes time and patience. If you love me in a year with half the ardour I see in your eyes today, and if one-tenth of the love that I now possess still lingers in my heart, then I shall count as blessed beyond compare and gladly be your wife. The prince knew that he had met his match. I surrender to your terms, but such a bargain should be sealed with a kiss. Indeed it should. And in the sweetness of that moment, Susanna knew that the coming year was going to be far more pleasant than the one just past. Turning again to Mordred, she said, If you really loved me, you should have told me so and released me from my promise. In return I might have loved you too, for the prince was only a dream then, a man who might have even forgotten me. Never, protested the prince. And as for your story, do you remember this? Susanna produced a small book of love poems written by Mordred 
to please the lady of the castle as he sheltered there one night from a storm. Susanna had found it when rummaging through Mordred's things to find supplies for her final task. Mordred flinched in recognition. Your punishment is this. The king's heralds will travel to every town and village to announce that Mordred the wizard betrayed the memory of one who loved him in hope of gaining his freedom. Mordred blushed with shame down to his toes. You will work for a year with the royal blacksmiths, teaching them what knowledge you have of crucibles and metal making. When you are done, you must build a house here, as high as the tallest oak tree. Make it fit for the birds so that they may nest in peace, sheltered from the wind. And down below, plant fields of honeysuckle and apple trees, so that meandering bees might dine upon their blossoms. This punishment seems a trifle light, suggested the prince. That may be so, smiled Susanna. But I would not have you think for all the world that I am cruel. Also, Mordred and I both know that his greatest punishment is the memory of a chair on which he can never sit again. Once they were married, the prince and his new princess went to visit her old village by the sea. After a happy week of celebrations, they tried to persuade Susanna's grandmother to go with them and live in royal luxury at the court. Despite their kindest arguments, the old lady was adamant in her refusal. There are still plenty of nets to mend and children to teach. What would I do in the palace? Such a place is for the young, for dancing and for love. Reluctantly, they returned without her, promising to come back and visit the old woman every spring. Strange as it might seem, Susanna's grandmother never mentioned to strangers that she was related to royalty. She believed that, nudges aside, success in love was a matter of fate and no reason for boasting. But each winter, when her old friend came with his bottle of rum, she would tell the story, with tears in her eyes, of how her granddaughter had outwitted Mordred the wizard and brought about the destruction of his castle.